All right, we'll get started. I want to welcome everyone here this morning and those online. Welcome you too. Um, the heat has descended. I'm telling you, I'm not. This northern boy has trouble with this time of year. <laughs> I guess it's a matter of adjustment, isn't it? Getting used to it. Um, and having to water things now that are growing that uh, don't get watered enough just on their own. At Jacob's well, Jesus talked to the woman from Sychar about water that gives life. And in multiple passages in Revelation, there are references to the water of life. Isn't it interesting that God took two molecules of one substance and one molecule of another substance, combine the two, and makes made a matter that comprises most of the earth and everything that's on it. Three little molecules. I find it interesting that Peter talks, but you don't see this in Genesis, but Peter talks about creation, and in 2 Peter 3, 5, he states that the earth was made from water and was made with water and then was destroyed with water. Made from water, made with water, destroyed by water. So water has been a very important part of this world from before creation. And it's been critical to physical life and is critical to spiritual life as well. Since we had all that water falling from the sky last week, well, the week before now, and now I've had a few days of bright sunlight with oppressive, in my opinion, heat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're just sitting back there, no, no, no. <laughs> you notice how things, uh, you'd have to be blind not to notice, I guess, have just <laughs> shot up. Things that depend on water and sunlight for life. They're thriving. And that is what happens when we deliver to folks the water of life and get them in the sun, S-O-N, light. That's what happens. They thrive, they rejoice, they take off. And that's what our study is about. Um, they are saved. That is why we're studying spiritual gifts, because the Spirit can work through His gifts to accomplish the same thing that we've observed in our world around us, to bring the water of life and to bring sun, S-O-N, light, to the church and to the world, the Spirit. And that's why we want to use our spiritual gifts and not hinder the Spirit's work. Okay. We are looking at the spiritual gift of knowledge, which we define as that special function given to God's, uh, given by God's Spirit to certain members of the body to acquire deep insights into God's Word and bring those insights to life in a way that defies human reason. Defies human reason. We reviewed the Colossians 2 passage. <clears throat> where Paul reveals that all of the treasures of knowledge and wisdom are kept in Christ. All of them. You don't know Christ? Not going to have knowledge. Not going to have wisdom. We looked at the Greek word for knowledge. Gnosis. G-N-O-S-I-S. -S, and its definitions. And we read a number of passages from Proverbs as Solomon talks about about knowledge. What is the word that is frequently associated with knowledge besides wisdom and is not a spiritual gift? We talked about that last Sunday. Understanding. And I attempted to show that while the definition of understanding differs from this, really it, it, it indicates an open heart, an open mind, open eyes to see what 
God through the Spirit wants to reveal to us. An openness to learn, an openness to grow. As Solomon states in Proverbs 15, 14, people with understanding want more knowledge. And after discussing these thoughts um, for your consideration, we looked at Luke. You remember this story in Luke 11 where Jesus accuses the, te the Pharisees um, and one of the lawyers, teachers of the law, took umbrage at how he was talking about the Pharisees, and Jesus said, okay, I'll talk about you, in verse 52. We read some verses from Romans 1, showing that a lack of understanding dooms one to ignore evidence that's all around us, as the presence and power of God is manifested in his creation. As Solomon would say, it dooms one to just wanting more foolishness. If you're going to ignore that, you're just doomed to want more foolishness. So, how does one gain spiritual knowledge? Now, I think I may have asked a similar question early. Alan answered through study. But what ingredients are present besides having understanding? We, we alluded to this earlier. Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, next slide, please. Verse 6, where he says, you got to be mature to receive wisdom. To speak of wisdom to those mature. This wisdom, though, is not from this world or from the rulers. I speak God's secret wisdom. Um, Jody, do you have that passage? You want to read 6 through 10, please? What's the next slide? You want to see if you can come back for the board? Since you've run that before, right? Okay, so God, go ahead, I'm sorry, I cut you off. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Okay. You're going to get wisdom, you're going to get knowledge with that experience. You remember Solomon talking about knowledge and searching for it? Um, he talks about treasure, searching for it as fine silver. Solomon's basically telling us the same thing as Paul is telling us here. Uh, you may recall in Proverbs 2, 6, he says, Only the Lord gives wisdom. He gives knowledge and understanding. The Spirit, no one's ever, the Spirit gives, searches out all things, and gives the information about God. The Spirit, verse 8 on the previous slide, is the one who reveals knowledge to us, spiritual knowledge. None of the rulers um, of the world knew about this, but the Spirit <coughs> reveals it. The Spirit
If we go back to Paul talking about the Spirit's role in 2 Corinthians 2, we had a slide up there. Um, in 11, he says, who knows, well, it was, I think, slide two. Yeah. He says, who knows the thoughts that another person has? I can't read your thoughts, Bill. Your wife may be able to, but I can't. It says only the spirit. And the only reason that wives have that special talent is because there is a little commonality. There is a sharing. Two have become one. There is a sharing of the spirit. But not in the same way that the spirit knows the thoughts of God. And Paul says only a person's spirit that lives within him knows his thoughts. And it's the same with God. Next slide, please. No one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Joe, do you want to read 12 there, please? And we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Do you remember what Jesus told his followers? I'm going to go away. I'm going to go away. If I don't go away, the Spirit won't be able to come. But when I leave, you're going to get the Spirit. He's going to comfort you, and He'll reveal to you the, thing, the thoughts of God. We receive the Spirit that is from God, so we can know all that God has given us. What are some things that God has given? given us that we wouldn't know about, we wouldn't be able to see in Scripture without the knowledge the Spirit gives. No matter how smart you are, you wouldn't be able to understand this. What are some things? different in the spirit than they do in the world. Forgiveness. Well, I don't know. Shall I give him seven times, Lord? It's like, a, it's like we have we get the pure version versus a watered down, distorted version. Of Distor what the world yeah. Takes turns it to. Especially distorted. Because that's what Satan loves to do. He loves to take a truth, tweak it just a little so it's no longer pure truth, and present it to us and have us believe it. What about uh, hope? Would you understand what faith is about if it weren't for the working of the Spirit? What about God's faithfulness? Now that is hard to understand sometimes even when you have the Spirit. That God is going to be faithful. He's going to take care of things. I don't see it, Lord. I'm got it. But I want to the world gives, give I you the, the, quote the old King James. I've got peace. You remember our, go ahead. And it's interesting, Joe, that this is where I think sometimes it's hard to fully appreciate or fully differentiate is we have a lot of these characteristics. People in general, all over the world have certain characteristics. Mm -hmm. And in my understanding,
Spirit in us. What about holiness? What is holiness to the world? What's that? Well, to some people it is. But, but there's a form of it. People think they're set apart to do something. Yeah. And they think they're doing good and they're set apart to do something good. And they would consider that a hybrid version of that. And many in the world think that if you come into this building, you're in a holy place. Or that certain things are holy. They're only holy if the Spirit's there. They're only holy if God said, this is holy, and he says to his people through the Spirit, you are holy. I'm holy, so you be holy, too. Because you're following me, and so we want to all be holy. It's kind of like the father taking his children along and saying, okay, now, we, want to, we all want to be really quiet, because I'm going to be quiet, and I want you to be quiet, too. It's the same concept. God says, I'm leading you along. I want you to just act the way I'm acting. <coughs> How would we understand what is in store for us in heaven? And even with the understanding of the Spirit, it's still like looking into a smoky mirror. Isaiah says, eyes not seen nor ear heard, and it's not even entered into the imagination what God has prepared for those of his people. How do we explain the peace that forgiveness brings unless one has the Spirit? How do you explain the comfort that God's promises bring without the Spirit providing knowledge? How would you go about using human logic? Donnie, I want you to read, if you would, please, Romans 8, verses 10 and 11. How would you use human logic? I don't care how many philosophy courses... Uh, debating courses, uh, whatever you want to use, you have taken. How would you use human logic to explain Romans 8, 10, and 11? If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. To somebody who has the spirit, who gives knowledge of God's thoughts, have a better understanding of that passage than someone who doesn't? Or have a better understanding of 1 Corinthians 2 where the Isaiah quote that I just mangled. Who's got the better understanding? No one has ever seen this. No one has ever heard about it. No one has ever imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. You know, it's tough for us, as Peter says, it's tough for us to understand a passage such as Romans 8, 10, and 11, even with the Spirit. At least it is for me. Maybe, maybe not for you. And of course, why is it easier for someone... With the Spirit, well, the answer is in verse 10, isn't it? Of, Second Corinthians, of uh, 1 Corinthians 2. God has shown us these things through the Spirit. You want to continue, uh, Jody, in verse 13 and 14, please? 
Yeah, and stop, let's see, yeah, 1 Corinthians 2, 13, 14. We also speak these things, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, inviting spiritual thoughts and spiritual words. But a natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But the one who is spiritual discerns all things, yet he himself is discerned by no one. Okay. How do you obtain real truth? I mean, Jody was talking about, you know, we have shades of this. That's kind of redundant, isn't it? Real truth. There's no such thing as false truth, right? If it's false, it's not true. It's kind of like saying, this is the genuine, original painting. Yeah. <laughs> Cynthia was asking me about it. He said, okay. Is counterintelligence, does that mean they don't know anything? <laughs> yeah. But, again, how do you obtain truth? Look at uh, John 16, 13, if you would, just Joshua. John 16, 13. the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare, you, declare to you the things that are to come. Again, I ask the question, can you get truth from any place besides through the spirit? Not through the way God defines truth, because Jesus said, I am the truth. And the Spirit says, I'll show you what that means. So, I hope by going through these scriptures, I've been able to demonstrate that every Christian's trait of knowledge is a gift of the Spirit. Even as knowledge is a spiritual gift to some that is like the gift of evangelism is like the gift of prophecy is like the gift it some have this in a great measure and that's the gift from the spirit but you can't get knowledge without the spirit and there's some smarter people out here with that wisdom and knowledge the wisdom isn't necessarily with knowledge Any other thoughts on that before we move on? How would you see this gift being used to build up the body? Remember, this person sees things in Scripture and maybe even in physical life that can only be explained using spiritual reasoning, and they have an extra measure of that, so they are able to see more deeply into things that are hidden from those who don't have the spirit of knowledge. How would you see that gift being used? To teach. So as a teaching, to share their knowledge. Okay. Do you remember Peter's comment about some of Paul's writings. I think I alluded to it briefly just a minute ago. Um, and I'm going to have Bill, if you would look at 2 Peter 3 15 and 16. We'll not read it just yet, but we will get to that. In 2 Peter 3 um, Peter is writing about the day of the Lord. He's, he's talking about Christ's reappearing at the end of time. And he talks about everything here, physical, everything that you know is going to be destroyed. 
it's going to be wiped out. And he reminds his readers that the faithful are looking forward to this day when the, God's going to bring them what he has promised. His promises never fail. Peter says he's going to reveal to you really what he's got. And then he says, do your best to be sinless. As God said, I'm holy, you be holy. Peter says, be, do your best to be sinless. And 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. 15 and 16. Yes, sir. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his, all his letters that are hard to understand, which the eager and the unstable... Okay, I'm going to stop you right there. <laughs> the ignorant and the unstable... These individuals lack knowledge of the truth, right? If they're ignorant, they're lacking knowledge. And what they lack knowledge of is the truth, okay? So these individuals, go ahead. Unstable and twist their, their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Okay. They try to explain scripture not using spiritual guided knowledge. And what are you going to come up with if you do that? It's twisted. It's twisted. It's not pure. It's polluted. But it's twisted for their own destruction. Yes, indeed. But to anybody that hears them, too, that believes. There are those that would, that would teach those things that have been twisted for the sake of their own I mean, as uh, I think you've probably heard Denny comment, I know I have on Tuesday morning, people that you might be studying with say, well, this is what you know, the spiritual authority that they've been looking to, whether it's a priest or a preacher or whoever, has been saying, well, why would they say that if that's not what the scripture says? Here it is. Ignorance. Yeah. Ignorance. Spiritual ignorance. Right. Twisted to their own destruction and to those who have been listening to them. What might be an example of I mean, we've brought up the, the idea many times of, well, all you have to do is believe. Leaves out that all-important ingredient of water, right? That God used to create the world, made the world out of it, and destroyed the world by it, and through it has saved us, as Peter says. Or repentance, or other things that are left out. You've got to be circumcised. You can't. You've got to still keep the law. And we don't get that because that's not been part of our heritage. But to the Jew, that was, I mean, that was... Sacrifice. Yes, it was, it was all in all. Um, Christ, you know, Christ never really became fully human. Not, not really. Really? Scripture says if you don't believe that Christ became human then you don't believe in God. You're calling God a liar. Um, these actually turn into the body of Christ and his blood. And you're actually you're drinking blood, eating meat. That's another false doctrine. The freedom in Christ. The, they're in church struggle with that. Today's church struggles with that. The freedom in Christ. Right? Well, and, and look at the freedom that they have uh, that those things do not actually uh, He said, thus remember me. Uh, those things don't actually turn into those things that sin is about. Right. And if, if you're still thinking
another debate, or a, not a debate, a, a question that was raised in our household this past week. Why do people pray to Mary? And I said, and, and, and why isn't that the same as praying through Christ? I said, because Christ is the avenue. He said, I'm the only, I'm the way, the way, uno, via, as they say in Spanish. And you go to a street and it says una via, don't go the opposite way, the arrow is pointing one way. Um, and that's the only way you can get to the Father. Bill, you ready to read again in 17? You therefore, beloved, my dear, beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the air of lawless people and lose your own stability. Yeah. You're going to fall away from your own faith if you start following these false doctrines that are not let knowledge revealed by the Spirit, knowledge revealed through the Spirit. So one with this gift could see things in Scripture and be able to guide others so that they are not led away by false doctrine, twisted knowledge. Um, those who would give false explanations of Scripture, back in the early church, maybe of prophecies, those with this spiritual gift would understand, no, 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 that's not, that's not the original gospel that was preached to us, as Paul talks about, to one of the churches he writes to. Don't stray from that. It's interesting, Tim Carter, so Paul's teachings are hard to understand. doesn't mean they're not true. Right. It does not, does not mean what he says is not correct. It means it's hard to understand. Mm -hmm. But there is an accurate And I think Donnie has mentioned in the past about this spectrum where we are. I mean, somebody that is a new babe and Christ is, is going to have one level of faith. And Paul, who has been studying the Old Testament since he probably started school, now the Spirit's using that knowledge, that level of maturity, to reveal new truths. And this is what the person who has this spiritual gift of knowledge is able to do. So. And it's kind of an aha moment mm -hmm. for Peter. Uh, and many of the others to say, wow, that's Peter. Yeah. No wonder Peter was stupid. He wasn't. No, no, no. Yeah. And with the Spirit, he had more understanding also than maybe the other fishermen who were not called years ago I visited my brother down in Searcy, Arkansas and we went into a Bible class and about half the staff of Harding's biblical program was in that Bible class. So needless to say I was left out because of the depth and the level that they were discussing spiritually. And I was I, I needed to be down down the hall somewhere. <laughs> now then it might be that if I went in 
tricky. But it was, uh, well, I, I felt intimidated mm. because of the level that they were, they, of their understanding of their human mind. So we, we have to remember that we're all different. The gifts are all different. And just because we're not the same level as somebody else, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Exactly. As long as we are pressing That's right. The understand having the understanding, right? It goes along with that. What's interesting is when we talk about this, you don't look at scripture. You don't have to have all level of knowledge and understanding to serve Christ, or to serve Christ and God the way they want to serve. You don't have to have that. Now, do you continue to gain and understand deeper? Yes, on your whole life. But to submit and serve the way you A.W. Tozer talks about <coughs> drinking from, uh, I'm garbling this, but something about drinking from the fountain that quenches your thirst but never fills you. You always want more. And that's really what we're talking about here. Um, Solomon said, the one who has understanding wants more knowledge. Wants more knowledge. This person might, number two, dark side, this person might be like, or no, but not the dark side, the number two point of how this person can be used by the Spirit. Might be like the prophet Elisha. Do you remember in 2 Kings chapter 2, um, the king of, let me get over there, come on, I think it's Aram. Yeah. King of Aram, at war with Israel. And every time he does something, it's like he is, Israel's just a step ahead. And he turns to his council and he says, what's going on? Who wears the leak? Who's telling Israel, the king of Israel, what our plans are. And somebody says, well, it's Elijah the prophet. I mean, he's, he's got God telling him these things. And he says, well, where is he? Go find him. Any of you ever been to Alabama? Dothan? Dothan, Alabama. Well, that's where, well, not, not Dothan, Alabama, but that's where Elisha was. Elisha's in Dothan. So the king of Aram says, we're going to get him. And he takes his army at night, surrounds the city of Dothan, and they wake up the next morning, and Elisha's prophet comes out, and he says, oh, my master, what can we do? We've got uh, all these chariots and horses and this army that's surrounding the city. And Elisha says, no worries. No worries. <laughs> yeah, right. The army that fights for us is larger than the one against us. And Elisha said, Lord, open his eyes. Let him see. And he sees that the mountain's full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And then Elisha prays to God. And the Lord blinds them. Elisha goes out. Who are you looking for? Well, Elisha, okay, come on, man, I'll show you where it is. Leads him right into Samaria. And the, the, is, 
uh, Israel's king says, okay, now shall I take them captive? Elijah says, no, sit them down, feed them. Give them stuff to drink, and then send them on their way. And he does. And the king of Aram never bothers them again. Never bothers them again. So this person <coughs> potentially might be like the prophet Elisha. Lord, let's help me open the eyes here so that the others can see this unseen spirit world that you're allowing me to understand. And this, in this way, this gift is similar to the gift of faith. But I think it's more contemporaneous focus, meaning things that are happening today versus faith is more, I mean, this is maybe splitting here. Faith is more focused on what is yet to be revealed. Um, there are a lot of crossovers, a lot of crossovers. But if you think about the trials that are going to come our way, think about, well, we used to Kelly's, uh, one with this gift of knowledge could potentially say this this is what this is the purpose this is what God wanted us to see in this situation or in anybody's suffering in hard times the death of a family member or the illness in a family member this is what I want you to to know, I want you to learn from this, and that person with knowledge can see those things and help us understand. Okay, I got it. You wanted you wanted me to increase my faith in you, Lord. I I've got it. I'm holding on tighter than ever. And um, so they can help us stand firm through periods of spiritual hard, hardship. Make sense. We'll stop there, and I appreciate your participation and reading, and hopefully it was helpful.